So we discussed the first two requirements, an agreement and consideration. The third requirement for a contract is capacity. The law generally assumes that all persons have the capacity to enter contracts. There are two exceptions, minors and mentally incompetent adults. A minor's lack of contractual capacity is relatively easy to establish because it's largely based on the objective criteria of their age. Determination that an adult lacks contractual capacity is more complex because it requires proof of mental illness or disturbance uh, sufficiently serious to render the person incompetent. Uh, a person's mental condition is proved by objective evidence, again that objective standard of his or her behavior that's observed by others or by expert psychiatric evidence. The underlying rationale for permitting the avoidance of a contract entered into by a person who lacks mental capacity is the protection of the incapacitated person. This suggests analogies both to improper bargaining and public policy. However, there are distinctions. Although improper bargaining may sometimes be present in an incapacity case, especially where the other party has exploited the lack of capacity, there's no requirement that any improper bargaining be proven. Uh, of course, a party taking advantage of an incapacitated party has, has an influence on the court's decision. So if someone does take advantage of an uh, incapacitated party, that will influence the court's decision whether to avoid the contract. However, the fundamental basis of incapacity is the legal status of the incapacitated party, meaning that the incapacitated individual can be in, meaning that the incapacity can be invo invoked even where there was no deception or illegitimate pressure in the formation of the contract and the contract may have fair terms. Incapacity is based on public policy of protecting an incapacitated person from assuming contractual duties to which she or she was not able to capably assent. And that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about capacity is the ability to uh, consent or be assenting because your, the agreement must be voluntary and we'll get there. So minors, let's let's jump into this. Minors, what's the age of majority? In most states, the age of majority is 18 years old. Some, t some states do provide for the termination of minority upon marriage. I, I do not know which ones those are, but let's, for the sake of this class, 18 is what we are gonna use as the age of majority. So does this mean that a minor can never enter into contracts? No, generally a minor can enter into contract uh, with an adult. They can enter into any contract uh, with an adult or that an adult can, provided that the contract is not one that's prohibited, prohibited by law for minors. What would be an example of that? The sale of alcohol. A minor cannot sell alcohol. Uh, however, contracts entered into by a minor are voidable at the option of the minor. The minor has the choice of uh, avoiding the contract. They can uh, avoid the contract or they can uh, disaffirm the contract by avoiding it. What, that's what they do, they call it disaff disaffirming. And uh, so that means, I might be jumping ahead here in my slides, yep, disaffirming. Legal avoidance of setting aside a contractual obligation. That's what a minor can do to avoid a contract. So when you enter, let's just back up a little bit. If a minor enters into a contract with an adult, which they can, the minor has the option of avoiding that contract by what we call disaffirming. It's the legal avoidance of setting aside a contractual obligation. If you are an adult, who enters into a contract with a minor, can you avoid, avoid your contractual duties on the ground that the minor can do so? No. The only way, if you're an adult, the only way you're out of a contract is if the minor exercises the option to disaffirm the contract. The adult party is bound as long as the minor wants to be. And the minor can be by this concept of ratification where the minor accepts and gives legal and gives legal force to an obligation, making it enforceable. So let's uh, jump into specific here. Disaffirming. What does a minor have to do to exercise disaffirmance? And how long 
does a minor have to disaffirm? Okay, disaffirmance. Like I said, legal avoidance or setting aside a contractual obligation. What does a minor have to do to exercise disaffirmance? One, they have to express it. So by words or conduct that show an intent not to be bound. And how long does a minor have to disaffirm? Any time during the minority and for a reasonable time after the minor comes of age. So that's the rule. Let's talk about some examples. So today you're 17 when you enter into a contract with me to buy a car. You promise to pay me $5,000 upon graduation in May and I agree to give you my car upon payment. You turn 18 the week before graduation. But then you decide you don't want to buy my car. Can you pull out of the deal? Yes, you could probably pull out of the deal because you can disaffirm any time during your minority. So you're 17, so up until the point you turn 18, which is a week before graduation. And then a reasonable time after you come of age. So 18 is our majority age that we're going to be dis using. So a week, that's reasonable. Maybe even a month, maybe two months. A year? Maybe not, maybe, depending on the circumstances. But it's a reasonable time after minor comes of age. And, and how do we determine reasonable time? By the objective standard, or what would a reasonable person believe as a reasonable standard, uh, a reasonable time to uh, disaffirm. So Drake's grandmother dies and leaves him a small rented house. As a minor, Drake is not prepared to manage the property, so he agrees to let his grandmother do so on his behalf. Five years after reaching his majority, Drake sells the house. His grandmother asks to be reimbursed for funds she has spent to maintain the property. Drake refuses. Does, great, does grandmother have any uh, recourse? Can Drake disaffirm the management agreement with his grandmother? A minor is bound by his contract unless the minor disaffirms within a reasonable time after the minor reaches majority. And what's reasonable will depend on the circumstances. In this case, it was five years. Five years have gone by. Is that reasonable? Court would probably say that this is uh, the disaffirmance was unreasonable five years uh, too late. What about this? Example, an adult enters into a contract with a 17-year-old minor where minor agrees to pay $5,000 for adult's car. Adult agrees to deliver the car to minor on Monday. And minor agrees to pay for the car on Wednesday. Adult delivers the car to minor. And then come Wednesday, the adult seeks the $5,000. The minor says, I want out of the deal because I'm a minor. And the contract is voidable and drives off an adult's car. Can the minor disaffirm the contract? Yes, the minor can disaffirm the contract. But when the minor disaffirms the contract, the entire contract is disaffirmed, not bits and pieces. So would he have to return the vehicle? Yes. Or the court may require him to pay the $5,000 if he would if minor turned around and then sold it to somebody else. So in this instance, despite the fact that the minor is a minor and the minor can disaffirm, but when, it dis when a minor disaffirms, they have to reimburse the other party if, in fact, the minor had received that party's portion of the performance or the, or the promise of the contract. What if the minor lies about his or her age? Can he or she disaffirm a contract? Generally, it doesn't matter if the minor lies about his or her age. They can still disaffirm the contract. But sometimes courts will refuse to allow disaffirmance unless they can return the consideration. Uh, others allow the, dis diff the uh, disaffirmance but makes the minor liable for any damages if there's uh, a lie. So if somebody's relying on those representations and then they attempt to disaffirm, they may be held liable when they intentionally misrepresent their age. Ratification. How does a minor ratify agreement? 
ratification, as I said, is the uh, act of accepting and giving legal force to an obligation that was not previously enforceable. So they can disaffirm any time up to majority and a reasonable time after. So how do they ratify that they want to enter into a contract? Mark enters into a contract to sell his piano to Andrew, who's a minor. Andrew does not disaffirm the contract. If on reaching the age of majority, Andrew writes an email to Mark stating that he still agrees to buy the piano. Has he ratified the contract? Yes, he has. How did he do that? He reached the age of majority and said that he wants to still buy the piano. They can do this. Uh, ratification can be expressed or implied. It was expressed in this, ca this case. So when a minor who reaches majority can state orally or in writing or by their conduct that they intend to be bound by the contract, they will have uh, ratified the contract and then would become liable or bound, I should say, not liable, they become bound. So Andrew takes possession of the piano and continues to use it well after reaching the age of majority. Has he ratified the contract? Yes, he has. How has he done that? By his conduct. So a minor can ratify a contract once they become a majority, either expressly or implicitly. Are parents liable for the contracts made by their minor, minor children or their minor, minor child? Can parents be liable for the contracts? No, they cannot. Parents' consent on a contract, however, uh, obligates the parent to become personally obligated to perform should the child not. So let's talk about this for a second. So minors who enter into contracts, so the vehicle uh, example that I just did with the $5,000 uh, vehicle. The child enters into a contract with an adult, minor 17, to buy the vehicle. Um, the adult in that contract cannot come to the parents, and when the minor bows out and says, no, I'm, I, I'm a minor and I'm disaffirming, the adult cannot come to that child's parents and say, you need to buy my car because the child made the deal. That's not how it works. Um, there are contracts. I, I'm sure that you've probably seen if you're under the age of 18 where you need a parent's signature in order to do something or to bind yourself to something. That is not a parent binding the child. What that is is the parent consenting or obligating themselves to become personally liable. So if, a, let's say, a child borrows money from... Uh, somebody and uh, they agree to pay that money back but because they're a minor after they've gotten the money they try to avoid the contract that adult might say I'll let you borrow the money child but your parent has to sign here as well so then that gives them a little uh, stake in the game when they get the parents obligation uh, to be bound by the child's agreement and so you're not binding the child you're binding the uh, parent when you get the parents uh, consent on a contract. Let's talk about this example. Josh is a minor and Josh Josh unfortunately is shot in the head at point blank range by another boy. Josh receives life-saving medical services from Yale Hospital and others. Yale bills Josh's mother for services but she declares bankruptcy and the debt is discharged. So I'm going to stop here for a second. Parents are have a duty and liability to their children in this instance parents would be responsible for their child's medical services. But because mother was discharged, she's no longer liable, but the debt is still out there. So when Josh re receives money for medical care from the shooter's family, Yale files a lawsuit to recover from Josh. Can Yale collect for his services from Josh, Josh who is a minor? Can uh, Yale sue him? And uh, is, there, is there a contract? Do we even have a contract? Do we have an agreement? I don't see any bargain for promises here. In this instance, a minor who receives life-saving medical services is liable for their reasonable value. And what's the theory that it would be under? This isn't a contract, but a court might consider this a quasi-contract sort of kind of contract. Somebody's uh, receiving a, a benefit. Yale Hospital would be unjustly enriched here 
if they weren't able to uh, collect the money. And Josh did receive a benefit. It was life-saving services. And we also call those necessities. So in this instance, a minor could be held liable for necessities despite the fact that uh, they are a minor. So when necessary medical services or clothes or shelter are provided to a minor whose parents do not pay for their services, a contract is imposed by law between the provider and the minor so that the minor is not unjustly enriched. So a minor could be held liable for necessities, even though they're a minor. Intoxicated persons is, uh, is someone else we want to talk about. Can someone who is intoxicated enter into a contract? They sure can. They can enter into a contract. What's the problem, though? And does it matter if the intoxication was voluntarily was voluntary or involuntary? Contract entered into by an intoxicated person can be either avoidable or it can be valid. Uh, involuntary intoxication, we know that's not something that we do to ourselves. Maybe somebody drugged us or maybe we're taking a, medic a new medication and we're going through a side effect. That's involuntary. Voluntary, so if you've been drinking or, you know, using drugs. So if the level of intoxication, oh, let me see, let's click to my next thing. So what happens to the contract and who has the power to avoid it? Okay, so my rule here is if the level of intoxication is sufficient to deprive intoxicated person of understanding or of the ability to act rationally, and the other party has reason to know of this, then the contract is going to be voidable. So it's a valid contract, which could be voidable. And who gets to exercise it? Well, the person who is, claims to be intoxicated. But the other party has to reasonably know that the person is intoxicated. And why do we have this? What are the courts preventing, even if it's voluntary intoxication? The, t the taking advantage of another person, one person taking advantage of another person. That's where we get the other party has reason uh, to know. So if uh, we're together, you know, drinking at a, at a bar and I'm a little tipsy or visibly intoxicated, I'm, I'm slurring my words and falling all over the place and you get me to sell my car to you for a hundred bucks, the next day when I sober up and realize that, I can void this contract by claiming intoxication. So, like I said, the courts are preventing uh, taking advantage of another person. And so what if I wake up the next day and I'm, I'm sober and I realize that I sold you my car and, hey, I was going to sell it anyway and it looked like a fair deal, so why not? So I can ratify the contract in this instance uh, once I am sober and have a clear and voluntarily understand what's happening, I can ratify it. Can you get out of it? Can you get out of the contract? No, you cannot unless I claim intoxication and it's voidable. So uh, if you got me to make an agreement with you to sell my car for a thousand bucks and the next day and I was intoxicated and the next day you change your mind and I say well that's a great deal you're gonna have to buy my car all right moving right along mentally incompetent persons contracts made by mentally incompetent persons can be void voidable or valid and mental incompetence is determined at the time of contracting if you enter into a contract today, but next week are deemed mentally incompetent due to a head injury, that contract is still going to be valid. Why? Because it has to be proven to have, the incompetency has to be proven to have existed at the time of contract, contracting. It's the basis for avoidance, even if the condition was temporary or has since been cured. But at but the uh, example I just gave, you were competent at the time we entered into the contract, even though I later, due to a head injury, become mentally incompetent. So it's at the time of contracting. So when is a 
contract void. Let's see when is a contract void due to mental incompetence. When is a I'm sorry. When is a con contract void due to mental incompetence? When is it void? Means it as void means the contract didn't exist. It's when a court adjudges a person mentally incompetent. The contract is void. It's like it never existed. Usually what happens is the court will then appoint a legal guardian and that person can enter into a contract on behalf of the incompetent person. But having a contract deemed void, it has to come from the court adjudging a person mentally incompetent. So when is a contract deemed voidable due to mental incompetence? meaning the individual claiming to be incompetent uh, exercises its, his or her right to avoid the contract. Example, Larry agrees to sell his stock in Google to Sergi for substantially less than the market value. At the end of the deal, Larry is confused about the purpose and details of the transaction, but he has not been declared incompetent. What, what, uh, what are Larry's options? Well, like a minor, mentally incompetent person can disaffirm or they can ratify. Uh, if not adjudged by a court that one is mentally incompetent, the court is going to presume that all adult parties are capable of contracting. So the burden is going to lie with Larry, the one claiming to be incompetent to prove the disabling condition. So what does it require? It requires that Larry is going to have to show that a condition existed, that it was in nature and extent severe enough to preclude an adequate degree of assent. And those are the two things. And what kind of evidence are we going to need? So it requires him to demonstrate both that the condition existed and that it was in nature and extent severe enough to preclude an adequate degree of assent. What might, what might he need to prove? Maybe psychiatric expert testimony? Testimony who observed the behavior of the party's transaction? He's going to need something more than his statement saying that he was incompetent. So he's going to have, have to have some sort of uh, expert information regarding his uh, psychiatric condition at the time. That's very hard to do. I've had a case, I've had a case like... Uh, like that, um, and it's hard to do. What else can uh, a mentally incompetent person do? That's one that's not uh, adjudged mentally incompetent by a court. They can ratify this this contract. Let's say you know Larry's confused, um, and he is deemed he was deemed to be incompetent, but then later you know his condition changed, and now he can understand, and he still wants to go through with the the deal to sell a uh, stock of Google. He can ratify it, just like a minor can ratify uh, a contract after uh, the minor becomes a majority. Take a look at Rhonda here, Rhonda's example. So Rhonda is diagnosed with manic depression, but a court has not declared her mentally incompetent. One afternoon, wearing shabby clothes and with her hair uncombed, she arrives at Classic Automotive. After two hours of negotiations, she trades in her Honda Civic and signs a lease for a BMW. She does not test drive the new car. She has difficulty removing the Civic's keys from her key ring, and the payments on the BMW are more than she can afford. What do we think about uh, Rhonda? What's Rhonda's issue? Do you th think she can uh, be released from her obligation of this contract under uh, incompetence? Well, the rule is if a person understands the nature and effect of entering into a certain contract yet simultaneously lacks capacity to engage in other activities, the contract will be valid. So the key is legally mentally competent for contractual purposes. So is Rhonda in this case legally mentally competent for contractual purposes? In this case, she uh, 
She's at the dealers negotiating for two hours. She trades in her Honda Civic. She signs a lease. She doesn't test drive the car, but you know the difficulty in removing her keys, uh, keys from the key ring, and not being able to afford the payments. Would that go against her ability to uh, make an agreement? Here, I don't think she's going to be able to avoid this lease agreement. Uh, you only can avoid it if at the time of the execution of the contract, the person did not reasonably understand the nature and terms of the contract, just as we have discussed the rule. Nothing in the situation indicates that she did not understand the terms or that she was executing uh, a lease agreement. She negotiated for two hours. Her shabby look, trouble with the keys, and high payments have no bearing on her ability with regards to the contractual entering into the contractual obligation. We would certainly need to know more, but in this fact pattern, it appears that Rhonda understood the nature and effect of ent entering into that contract. So we have covered agreements, the agreement component of a contract, consideration and contractual capacity. Now we are gonna talk about the legality component. Legality is the fourth requirement for a contract to be valid and enforceable. It must be formed for a legal purpose. It can't, for a contract to be valid, like I said, has to be valid uh, and enforceable. It must be formed for a legal purpose. It can't, you cannot have a contract to do something that is illegal or contrary to public policy. We talked a little bit about this in the introduction uh, uh, portion last week. So if a contract to do something that is prohibited by law or illegal, it is void and unenforceable. Same thing if it's against public policy, it will be deemed unenforceable. So what happens if you make this kind of contract? Let's talk about a couple examples here. Actually, let's, actually, let's talk about um, illegal what types of contracts might be illegal, okay? Or what would void as a legality, as un, uh, illegal. Contracts to commit a crime, that's the obvious one. Contracts that are usury, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about contracts involving gambling. And we're gonna talk about contracts involving licensing statutes. When you enter into business uh, relationships with people who have a professional license, such as an accountant or a lawyer, um, you assume that the other person has a license or the, the professional has a license. And, and in some instances, uh, you can make an agreement where someone doesn't have a license, so that would void your contract. But we'll talk specifically about that in, in a second. So, example. What if you contract with me to steal a classmate's computer? I pay you $50 to steal your steal your. Uh, friend's computer and bring it to me by the end of the day. And you do that, and you bring it to me by the end of the day, and I refuse to pay you $50. Can you sue me? No, you cannot sue me. That's a contract to commit a crime. That one's an easy one. We did that one in intro. Usury. What is it? It's charging, basically it's, it's charging an illegal rate of interest. What does that mean? Every state has an enacted uh, statue that sets the maximum rate of interest that can be charged for a different type different types of transaction it, ch it ordinary ordinarily they're related to loans different types of loans car loans real estate loans for mortgages personal loans whatever type of loan it is states have statues that govern the maximum rate of interest that can be charged on any one of those so a lender who makes a loan at an interest rate above a lawful maximum commits usury. And the rates vary from state to state. For example, in New York State, charging interest of more than 16% uh, is usury on a, on a personal loan. So if you uh, make a deal with a loan shark and the interest on the loan is 25%, that's going to be an illegal contract. Gambling, wagers, and games of chance are illegal. All states regulate gambling. You can't set up a personal casino at your home and invite your neighbors to come in. 
Uh, I think they made a movie on that. It was Will Ferrell in it. But nonetheless, gambling, you cannot make contracts that involve gambling. States regulate the lottery, horse racing, casinos, bingo. Even there's some games of chance for charitable purposes. R raffles, you've seen those. Raffles are regulated by rules. And uh, they're actually very strict. Uh, people don't really follow them like they should be. Uh, with regards to selling them and how many you can sell and where you can sell them, especially with the with the internet, but uh, I don't see it enforced that often. So let me give you this example. Each of five coworkers receive a free lottery ticket from a customer. The coworkers orally agree to split the jackpot if one of the tickets turns out to be a winner. When one of the tickets is a winner, its holder decides not to share the proceeds. The other co-workers file a lawsuit to collect. Can they win? Is that an enforceable agreement? Nope, that is not an enforceable agreement. That is a contract regarding gambling. Crazy as that sounds. So it's a, this is an exchange of promises to share winnings from the lottery tickets. It is uh, based on an uncertain event and it's founded on gambling consideration, therefore it's void. Licensing statues. Certain professions, like I said, require licensing. Doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, stockbrokers, accountants. If you enter into an agreement with someone to do work and they are unlicensed, uh, you hire someone with a law degree to draft a separation agreement, but let's say they weren't licensed in the, in the state. Um, is that an illegal contract? That's going to depend on the purpose of the licensing statute. In New York State, there's actually, it is a crime to engage in the unauthorized practice of law. So it would be illegal in New York because there's actually a crime on the books that says you, you wouldn't be able to do that. But let's take something like a contractor. In some states, license, contractors have to be licensed. In Connecticut, license, uh, contractors have to be licensed. In New York State, contractors do not have to be licensed. So, but the purpose of the licensing statute in general is to make money, is for the state to make money, basically. You pay $100 and we're going to give you your, and you do these things and we're going to license you to be a licensed contractor. It doesn't operate um, in, in that instance, it's to raise government money. It doesn't uh, enforce the ability to get the professional work that you paid for, such as uh, a doctor. <laughs> if, you're, if you go to a doctor who's not licensed, and there's again another law, usually those types of things, there's actually criminal laws relative to that. You cannot be a doctor unless you're licensed, cannot be a lawyer unless you're licensed. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, there isn't any uh, law relative to uh, accountants or real estate brokers or stock brokers if uh, you engage in the practice of those without a license that there, there is a crime for that. Um, so I'm assuming the purpose of those would be to make money for the state. Then those contracts are going to be enforceable. The ones that create a crime are going to be void as illegal. All right, pu policy. Contrary to public policy, contracts are not enforceable because of the negative impact uh, that, that would, they would have on society. For instance, if you make a contract to sell your child, that's actually not a crime to do that, but uh, it certainly would be against public policy and avoid contract. Things like constraints on um, restraint on trade, the interference with free competition, public favors competition, and unconscionable contracts or clauses and exculpatory clauses. Those are, this is back to the releasing uh, a party from liability for his or her wrongful acts. So these types of contracts are going to be deemed unenforceable because they are contrary to public policy. Unconscionable contracts or clauses. There could be a clause in a contract that's deemed unenforceable as, as well as the contract and not deem the whole contract enforceable. So I put that distinguishing contract clause. Uh, that is an unconscionable contract is void because one party is forced 
to accept the terms that are unfairly burdensome and that unfairly benefit the other party. What we're looking at is that the contract or the clause shocks the conscious. Earlier I said that the courts do not look at the fairness or equity of a contract, like the adequacy of consideration. Courts don't come uh, there to aid just because you made an unwise decision. However, when bargains are so oppressive, they unjustly inflict a hardship in some cases, the courts may relieve an innocent party or part uh, or relieving them of all or part of their duties as the terms of the agreement were unconscionable, or grossly unfair, unethical. Uh, most commonly, you see this most commonly associated with consumer transactions in which a la relatively large and powerful corporation, they supply a standard form to the little consumer and there's no real opportunity to negotiate. But uh, Unfortunately, with that said, a contract is not unconscionable merely because it is on a form drafted by a powerful corporation and there's not an opportunity to negotiate. And, and it's not, the doctrine isn't confined to consumer transactions. That's mostly where we, we see it. So the court has the power to refuse enforcement of an unconscionable contract or to adjust the contract by removing or modifying the unconscion unconscionable term. So how we determine that use an example. Smith, a welfare recipient with a fourth grade education, agrees to purchase a 55-inch flat screen TV from A Plus Appliances for $3,000. Smith signs a two-year installment contract. The same TV usually sells for $1,000. So after paying $900, Smith refuses to pay any more and A Plus sues to collect. Do you think this uh, is an unconscionable contract? Well, the court's going to look at a few things here. I, you know, the unfair bargaining leading up to unfair contract terms. Uh, there's, it's, they look at procedure, and they look at substance. Was the procedure unconscionable, as if an unfair bargaining took place? The parties lack of knowledge, understanding of terms due to print or language, an opportunity to read, opportunity to ask questions, maybe in get involved in the negotiation, and did that leave to a substance, uh, was the contract in substance unconscionable? Was it you know, unfairness in result? Uh, one's party had a vast, one party had a bigger bargaining stake, and when the courts look, both of these need to be present, not one, not the other. So the question is, is Smith required to pay the remaining $2,100? Do you think this is un the contract was unconscionable? I believe, in this instance, that it would be deemed unconscionable. In this here, we have the buyers. If if uh, A plus sued and brought this matter to to court, I think uh, Smith could raise lack of education, disparity in bargaining power between the parties, the price of goods. That was, I mean, not necessarily the market the disparity in the market value alone. I mean, the court, like I said, the court doesn't consider adequacy, but when you add that to everything else, this may be deemed an unconscionable contract. Exculpatory clauses. This is where a, uh, these are clauses that releases a party to a contract from liability for his or her wrongful acts, no matter who, who's at fault just says, you can't sue me. Um, these are, I, they fall under the unconscionable element, but they, are, they do have a separate, uh, separate consideration. They're deemed enforceable. Uh, take this, for example, Madison Manufacturing Company asks Joe, a new employee, to sign a contract that includes a clause absolving Madison from liability for harm caused by accidents or injuries in the factory, or which may result from defective machinery or carelessness or misconduct of himself or any other employee in service of the employer. Okay, so Joe is injured uh, when he trips over a bin that's left in the middle of an aisle and he falls onto the conveyor belt and his hand is trapped, ultimately crushing his hand. Joe sues Madison for negligence because the an employee left a bin in the middle of the aisle. We'll say, I doesn't say it in my example, but how did the bin get in the middle of the aisle? 
Madison exercises this clause, avoiding its responsibility. Can they? Can they say, well, too bad, so sad, you signed this clause that said if you're injured or you have an accident and it doesn't matter whose fault it is, whether it's your own or somebody else's? No, this is deemed unconscionable. It will be unenforceable because it's contrary to public policy. So what's the effect of illegality? So if you're a party, what if, if you're a party to an illegal contract and you served your end but not received your benefit, this is the $50 example to steal your classmate's laptop and bring it to me, you can't recover, okay? We know you just, if you're a party to an illegal contract, you can't recover and you've done your side of things. Unfortunately, it's too bad, so sad. But what if there's justifiable ignorance? Consider this. Debbie contracts with Tucker to purchase 10 crates of goods that legally cannot be shipped or sold. Trucker hires, Tucker hires a trucking company to deliver the shipment to Debbie, and Debbie agrees to pay the trucking company fee of $500. So trucking company delivers, and then Tucker refuses to pay. Can trucking company recover? from either Tucker or Debbie or both. So we know it's uh, goods that can't legally be shipped. So this is, a, this is a legal, it's a legal arrangement between Debbie and Tucker. But now we have this third party trucking company who gets called to say, hey, will you ship these? Tucker doesn't know what the item is. He just delivers. Should uh, Trucker be allowed to be paid? And the answer is yes, the trucking company is an innocent party. Justifiable, this is justifiable ignorance to the, the fact that the goods are illegal. He doesn't know what they are. So in this instance, the trucker would be able to collect uh, the fee. And then my last question to you is, can you withdraw from an illegal contract? Yes, at any time. It's going to be void regardless. So even if you enter into the contract with me to steal your friend's laptop to get 50 bucks, and the next day you kind of think about it, you're like, oh, that's a bad idea, you, you can get out. So that's, uh, those are the elements of uh, a contract. We had agreement with an offer and acceptance. We had consideration. We had capacity, and we had the legalities. And even though we have all of those things met and we have a valid contract, there are still times when a contract uh, may not be enforceable. And we'll be dealing with those two things, one being consent and the other being proper form.